Welcome to the College Investor Audio Show, where we talk about the biggest issues impacting millennial money, from student loan debt to side hustles to building wealth. We will show you how to get out of debt so that you can build real wealth for the future. Talking about charity today on the College Investor Audio Show. Welcome. Charitable giving, one of the best possible uses of money. Many people who start investing early in life will be in a position to give throughout their career and through built-up assets during their retirement years. It's important to approach charitable giving with pure motives, though. But givers can enhance the effects of their giving by using tax optimization strategies. The Donor Advised Fund is one tool that givers may want to employ to maximize their giving potential. However, the tool isn't always the best fit. We explain when it makes sense to use a donor-advised fund and how to effectively fund and give from it. First of all, what's a donor-advised fund? A donor-advised fund, DAF, is an investment account where 100% of the proceeds are legally required to go to charitable organizations. Investors who use DAFs take an upfront deduction when they contribute to a DAF, but the funds can be distributed at a later date. Assets put into a DAF are technically owned by a sponsoring organization. For example, Vanguard Charitable, Fidelity Charitable, Schwab Charitable, I love saying Schwab, don't you? (laughs) Or National Philanthropic Trust. Typically, these organizations only give funds to organizations as directed by the donor. However, they may have rules that require a minimum number of gifts per, per year. Individuals, couples, families, companies, and trusts can all have a donor-advised fund. The fund can make grants to all publicly recognized charitable organizations. Here are some of the pros of donor-advised funds. Using a donor-advised fund to give charitably can be an excellent option. These are a few of the reasons to consider it. Donate funds in a tax-efficient manner, of course. So people who use donor-advised funds often contribute appreciated assets to the fund. By contributing appreciated assets, the account owner avoids paying capital gains taxes on the asset and they get to claim a deduction for the contribution. Charitably inclined individuals may also set up a DAF when they have a large windfall. For example, someone who sells a business or receives stock options may contribute funds in one lump sum. This maximizes the deduction for a given tax year while allowing that person to direct funds over several years. It's pretty cool. Also, funds can remain invested for growth. Assets within a DAF can be invested for growth, and then they can be invested until the donor gives them away. (laughs) This is especially useful for people who want to plan annual contributions for several years. DAFs simplify record-keeping, too. So donor-advised funds typically have a grant-giving function. They allow filers to give financial gifts to charitable organizations, of course. And then with this function, givers don't have to track each gift they give. Instead, they can just track the receipts generated by their donor-advised fund. One more pro, they have very high maximum donation thresholds. Donors can contribute up to 60% of their adjusted gross income in cash to a DAF, or 30% of their adjusted gross income in appreciated assets. This limit allows people to give large lump sums without committing to specific charities at the time of giving. Now, of course, with any pros list comes a cons list. Let's take a look at some of the cons. Only useful for high income or high net worth people. Really, the DAF is not a great tool for people who want to give like a few thousand bucks each year. People with high incomes or large asset bases can take advantage of its tax-optimizing power. These folks can save a lot of money through tax-advantaged giving. But the average person, yeah, not really going to benefit from the added complexity. (laughs) Funds are inaccessible in an emergency. Very important. A donor-advised fund works as if the money in the account has already been donated. Investors cannot take money out of the account for personal use, even in the event of an emergency. So you should only contribute money that won't be needed in the future. You can have delays giving charitable gifts when funds are available. A lot of charities can handle large gifts, and they, but they do need the funds to continue operating. 
Contributing to donor-advised funds actually delays getting the funds into the hands of charities. In a lot of cases, the giver gains tax advantages, but the charities don't get money for years. Hmm. Some donor-advised funds have high expenses, too. Historically, DAFs had high management and maintenance expenses, while a few companies like Charles Schwab, Fidelity, and Vanguard have lower cost options, givers do need to look out for those fees. There may be a minimum giving restriction, too. Sponsoring organizations can place restrictions on grants given from DAFs they sponsor. So, for example, most have minimum gift thresholds ranging from 50 to 500 bucks. The sponsoring organizations may also require a minimum frequency for issuing gifts and grants. Contribution minimums can be prohibitively high. Some brokerages have very high initial investment and additional contribution minimums. Vanguard, for example, has a $25,000 initial contribution minimum. Charles Schwab and Fidelity have no minimum requirement. All gifts must be recognized nonprofit organizations. That can be a con too. DAFs must contribute to recognized 501c3 organizations. So right now, the definition of these organizations is pretty broad. It includes religious organizations, scientific organizations, sports, recreation, schools, literary, charities, medical and public safety. Yeah, the list goes on. Laws governing this could change. And your preferred organization may no longer be fundable. Here's another con. Seems like we have more cons than pros, by the way. Funds technically belong to a sponsoring organization. A DAF's sponsoring organization actually technically owns the assets in a DAF. In practice, most sponsoring organizations will direct funds however the owner wants to give the funds. However, the organization could go rogue and give to any charitable organization it prefers. Yikes. Donor advised fund contribution strategies. Let's take a look at a few of those. So if you think a DAF is right for you, here are a few of the strategies you might want to use to fund the account. Fund now, give later. <laughs> so during a high income year, or maybe a few years, a charitable person may choose to contribute to a donor advised fund. During lower income years, this person can continue giving charitably through grants from the DAF. Pretty cool. This is especially useful for high-income individuals who plan to retire within a decade or for people who are receiving windfall income, like selling real estate or a business. Donate a high-flying stock. Contributing an appreciated asset to a DAF maximizes your tax deduction while also eliminating capital gains taxes. Givers can even rebuy the stock in their regular portfolio at a higher price point. You can also rebalance into a DAF. Investors who regularly rebalance a regular brokerage account sell high-performing assets to buy less expensive investments. Rather than selling the high-performing investments, an investor might choose to donate some or all of the appreciated assets. This leads to tax savings on the capital gains, even if a person won't be able to itemize their taxes in a given year. Also, recurring contributions. People with very high incomes might want to put a set percentage of their income in a donor-advised fund every year. This will allow them to give now and save to give in the future. Automatically contributing from cash flow can ensure that the DAF gets funded to its full potential. Donor-advised fund giving strategies. We have three really good giving strategies to look into. You can give a percentage of the account. Donors might want to give a set percentage of their account balance each year. You know, for example, you might choose to give 5-10% to of your portfolio each year. When the portfolio declines in size, the giving declines with it. You can also create recurring grants. Donors might choose to give recurring grants to their preferred charities. For example, a donor might give $10,000 annually to their church and then $10,000 to a local food shelf. The DAF can give these funds in perpetuity until the assets run out. These gifts can also be based on a percentage of the total portfolio, too. You can also get the family involved. This is when it gets fun. 
Donors can build a charitable legacy by encouraging their children and grandchildren to be involved in the grant-making process. The donor can add secondary advisors to an account. These advisors can be trained in grant-making and they can take over the account when the donor is unable to manage it any longer. Here's where to open a donor-advised fund. If you're interested in this, you will need to select a sponsoring organization, which is kind of like a brokerage. Now, we have a chart at thecollegeinvestor.com, and in that chart, it shows the types of assets that each organization accepts, the minimum initial contribution, and the minimum size gift. We also list the range of annual account fees. These factors are likely to influence which sponsoring organization suits your needs the very best. Again, that chart is at thecollegeinvestor.com. Just copy and paste the title of this podcast into the search bar and you'll find it. Here are some alternatives, by the way, to the donor-advised fund. Qualified charitable distributions. So people aged 70 and a half and older can make distributions from their IRA to the charity of their choice. QCDs are excluded from taxable income, making them an incredibly tax-efficient option for everyday people with retirement accounts. Man, I love that idea. Bunching gifts is a good idea, too. People who give several thousand dollars every year may choose to increase the tax efficiency of giving by bunching two or more years of giving into a single tax year. For example, a couple that gives $15,000 annually cannot itemize their taxes. But if they give $30,000 one year and zero the next, they can itemize during the year they contribute thirty grand. Give what you can, regardless of the tax implications. Developing a charitable giving habit when you're earning less money will help you give more when you have more to give. Even if you can't give in a tax-efficient way now, consider giving a percentage of your earnings to develop your charitable giving muscles. As your income and assets grow, you can reevaluate how to give in the most tax-optimized way possible. And here are just a couple of final thoughts. A donor-advised fund is an excellent tool for increasing the tax efficiency of giving, especially if you're entering the highest income years of your life. It can allow givers to donate now and give recurring gifts throughout their lifetimes and into the next generation. But the DAF isn't necessary to start giving. If you're not a good candidate for a DAF, let's face it, most of us aren't, don't let it stop you from giving now to make the world a better place. I love giving! If you want to find out more about this, dive a little bit deeper, even look at some of the alternatives a little closer too. You can find this article at thecollegeinvestor.com. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk to you again real soon.